Let's start this morning, and I want to ask you a question. What are you living for? What are you living for? Now, this might sound familiar because Captain Peter asked you this last week. So if you were with us in worship last week, you've already heard this question. But what are you living for? Maybe the next uh, big break in your career. Maybe you're living for a lottery opportunity or gambling winnings. Shame, shame, that's not. <laughs> Maybe you're living for the perfect family, perfect marriage, perfect children. Uh, maybe you're uh, living for the next big thing in your life. But what do you live for? It's sad to say, but most people don't say, I'm living for Jesus that every moment of my life would be obedient to him. That might be what we say, but is that the truth of our life? As we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter these last three or four weeks, and as we continue to study it, we're reminded that the very foundations, foundation of our life should be set and built upon Jesus Christ. He is what we live for. Not stuff, not other people, not our jobs, not our families. We live for Christ. Why? So we can bring pleasure to God through obedience. That's what First Peter, what the Apostle Peter is trying to communicate with us. So if you haven't been with us the last couple of weeks, let me give you a quick refresher, which every week when I prepare the, the recap, I'm like, I wonder if people think, why don't they just give us the recap instead of a whole sermon every week? That's... No, you get to sit and listen. <laughs> but here's the recap for the last three or four weeks, in case you were gone. So, in the first, last three chapters, we've been reminders, reminded that first we're followers of Jesus, which means we are strangers, we're, we're foreigners in this world. And then he also reminds us of our saving grace, that we were saved through Christ, through his life and death and resurrection. We were reminded of our sanctifying grace, that idea that the Holy Spirit is working through us and that all of these experiences of God's grace in our lives contribute to the spiritual house of believers. Because we've experienced grace, we have a connection with one another. And above all, with that connection, that our cornerstone of our spiritual home is Jesus Christ. And then last week, Captain Peter graciously took on the topic of submission. He submitted to his wife by taking that week. <laughs> he, he covered with us the main point that number one, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to submit to God. Our submission is to God. And because of that, submission to others uh, follow suit. And I think that actually is represented perfectly in the words of Jesus when he talks about the greatest commandment in Mark 12 30. And he says, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's the guidance for, for submissive love to love God, to love others, to submit to God, to care for, to love others and how we live. So after exploring uh, what it means to demonstrate here in chapter three, we're gonna pick it up in verse eight. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter three, and we're gonna start with verse eight. And remember where we're coming from, this instruction from Peter to be people of submission. And then the Apostle Peter, he wraps it all up with these instructions for his audience in verse 8. So I'm actually going to read from the New American Standard Bible. This is what it says. Uh, in, in our NIV, it says, finally. In the NASB, it says, to sum it all up. So remember where we're coming from, the context. He says, to sum it up, all of you. So this is instruction for all of us. Be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And then the Apostle Peter, he quotes Psalm 34. It says, for the one who desires life, to love and see good days, 
must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Friends, as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, this is specific instruction on how we should live. If you haven't heard this in the last four weeks, hear it today. We are supposed to be different from the rest of the world. And here's the deal. Too many Christians have have become comfortable, not just living in the world, we've been, become too comfortable being sassy, <laughs> right? Sometimes it feels very good to be sassy. <laughs> but here's the truth. We've become so quick with our tongues and, and our keyboards and our pens that we're not demonstrating lives that are holy. Rather, we're demonstrating that we can be as witty and as rude as the rest of the world. I think a lot of people truly love Jesus, but they never change their behavior. What is the Apostle Peter telling us here? He's saying how you treat other people is important. How you respond to hostility is important. This is clear instruction on how to practice holy living. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called. How are you doing at allowing the Holy Spirit to control your tongue? How are we doing at allowing the Holy Spirit to change our very attitudes and our thoughts? I mean, sincerely, are we, are we sympathetic people? Are we kind? Are we eager to share a blessing? Or are we judgmental and mean and eager to slander another person? Friends, our actions in this world will either be interpreted as a blessing or a black eye. Are you blessing others with your life or are you hurting them? And verse 12 profoundly says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And listen, his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Friends, that we might be righteous people who do good. I love what happens next because the Apostle Peter, after he gives this astounding exhortation, encouraging people how to live, he tries to offer some tact in his, deliv in his delivery of the next message he shares. If you look at verse 13, he says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? If you've lived a little bit of life, you might know that there's still plenty of people who will harm you for doing good. But look at what he says in verses 14 through 17. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So here the Apostle Peter introduces this concept of suffering for doing good. 
And, and he does it again actually at the end of the next chapter. So turn your page to chapter 4, verse 12. Kind of book ending. He says in 4.12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. And that's exactly what you think it is, by the way. Meddler listed there with murderer and thief. Verse 16, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is the second time this morning you've heard that truth. First, out of the mouths of young people. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ does not exempt you from suffering. There's a dangerous heresy in, in our Christian culture that suggests if we're obedient enough, if we, if we give enough, if we have faith enough, that God will bless us with stuff and fortune. That is the root of, you might be familiar with this phrase, the prosperity gospel, and it is wrong. Does God bless us? Yes. Is it because of what we do? No, grace is free. It is unmerited favor. Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again, created reconciliation between us and God so that we can experience redemption, so that we can be saved from our sin. Suffering is a reality of our world. Now, it is important to know, yes, there could be suffering that is self-inflicted. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced a consequence. You should all be raising your hands, because there, there are good consequences too, but I think we've all experienced it, a, a bad consequence as well, or one that we're not happy with. And we do invite suffering into our life when we do wrong. There are consequences for poor choices, for sin. But we have to learn to live with those situations and move on. So if you're suffering because of self-inflicted choices, what do you do? You turn to the Lord, you repent, you turn away from that sin, and you move on. Do you often still have to deal with consequences and maybe continued suffering? Yeah, sometimes that's part of the situation. But we also need to recognize that there is suffering just because there is sin in the world. If you've lived, you've suffered. If you've ever heard a detailed accounting of a child being born, they're suffering in birth, <laughs> and they're suffering in living. And the Apostle Peter tells us here that there is suffering even for doing good. I don't know what you all think about spiritual warfare, but I know for a fact that there is a battle between good and evil going around us all the time. There's a war for souls, a war against people who are pursuing holiness. And we will experience suffering for doing good. And that doesn't mean we stop doing good because they're suffering. What Peter is saying here is don't give up. The world is broken and full of sin. And because of that, we need to recognize suffering for what it is and face it and fight 
the good fight. Friends, we don't suffer because we lack faith but because there's a battle for souls going on all around us. Often when we come up against suffering, we begin to question God. We start to doubt his ability, our infinite God, omniscient, omnipresent, God, we begin to doubt his power when instead we should be heeding the advice of chapter 4, verse 19. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. I don't know about you, but I want to be like that. Let's recognize our suffering and the suffering around us. And instead of getting moody and angry about it, let's move forward and do the good that God has called us to do. Friends, suffering should be our expectation. And when we're not personally suffering, we're called to care for those who are. Here's the root issue. How you react to suffering, how you react in day-to-day life with other people, how you react to hostility and trial, it's connected to the condition of your heart. Turn back in chapter three and look at verses 15 through 18. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Friends, do you want to have a holy life? Do you want to be able to cope with suffering? Set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. I mean, what what does that mean to make Christ Lord of your heart? There's an extended definition for this Greek word here, and it says this, Lord means he to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding, master, the owner, one who has control of the person. Think about this. Who is the master of your heart? Christ? Your job? Your family? Yourself? You will never be satisfied or sustained or content or comforted unless you let Jesus be Lord of your heart. And I want to tell you something beautiful happens when we let Christ be Lord. Not only are you able to to cope amid suffering, but you're filled with courage to speak the gospel truth. Truly, you are filled with courage and even ability to speak truth. Look at the rest of verse 15. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Another version says it like this. It says, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. That Greek word there, defense, it's translated, it's apologia. It sounds like apologetics. If you've heard apologetics before, it's, it's the defense of something. And 
often associated with the defense of the Christian faith. Why we believe what we believe. And so when Peter says here, always be prepared to give an answer, always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that you have when somebody asks you, he's saying, do you know what you believe? Are you prepared to speak about the changing power of Jesus Christ? The power that will transform you, that has transformed you. And always means always. <laughs> always be prepared to share the truth of the hope that drives you, that has changed you, that has transformed you. Friends, do you know what you believe in? Do you understand the gospel? Do you spend enough time in God's word to understand his redemptive plan to the point that you can communicate it? We all have things in our lives that are our favorite things that we are able to communicate about, that we get excited about. Can you communicate the gospel truths? Can you share your testimony of what God has done in your life? Peter says, always be prepared. You know, I have a distinct memory of one of the first times I shared this hope with somebody else. I was 15 and I was filled with the spirit and emotional high of being at a youth conference about evangelism. So of course, what is the first thing I do when I get on the plane? I try and convert the steward. <laughs> I was one of those 15 year olds that had boundary issues, I think, <laughs> not maybe good discernment at that time. And I was so excited to draw a picture of what reconciliation to God looked like. I took you know, that little flight napkin and I'm like, let me show you what I learned this week. I was so excited to share the hope that I knew and that I had, and I was excited that I felt equipped to share that testimony. And I do, I just, you know, I still, I think about that memory fondly. I was so pumped to share the gospel. And with an adult, too. I felt really smart. <laughs> I shared the hope that fueled my young heart and my mind that gave me hope. But I want to tell you, something happened a few months later. For the first time in my life, I came face to face with adult-sized suffering. That was the same year that, that my, my dad passed away. It was just literally four months after this testimony sharing on the airplane. And my father died and I was faced with gut-wrenching, heartbreaking loss. So all of a sudden, 15-year-old me has to reconcile in her mind this loving savior with suffering that I was feeling in my very self. I had to come to terms with this personal reality. And many of you know the hard spiritual and emotional work it takes to work through suffering and loss. But let me tell you, in the midst of the suffering is when we should be most prepared to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Do we suffer? Yes, we suffer. But do we have hope? Yes, we have hope. Something happened several months after my father was promoted to glory. So here I am, still 15-year-old kid. And I joined a grief support group at my high school. You can imagine what that looked like. It's very emotional. And I need you to know, amidst all my grief, my heartache, my doubt, my questioning, I, recon I recognize something about myself amidst the suffering with other people. I had hope. I sat in that circle of teenagers and it was so depressing and overwhelming. But I was different. Because although I was sad and I was grieving, I have hope. 
and I had hope, and it made a difference. And you better believe, you know what I did? I shared my hope with those teenagers. And that's an intimidating and scary thing to do. Did people kneel and accept Christ right there? No. They looked at me as strange and different. <laughs> but you know what? When you have hope in Jesus Christ, you have comfort and peace even amidst your suffering. And that is what we should always be willing and able and wanting to share. To defend our hope. And please do it in the way that the Apostle Peter tells us here, with gentleness and respect. Ties right back into verse 8. How you deliver the message is very important. Christ is not asking us to go on offense here. He's asking us to be prepared to defend our hope. He's asking you to gently, to kindly point people to him. And friends, even more than that, are you speaking defense of your hope? Are you living it? Is your testimony, is your life a testimony to the hope of Jesus Christ in your life? Do we suffer? Yes, we suffer. Do we have hope? Yes, we have hope. We're going to take time this morning to pray. Where is the Lord speaking to you? Where has he revealed himself to you this morning? Is he Lord of your heart? This is an important question because if you're running the show, it leads to more suffering. <laughs> Jesus Christ as Lord of your heart, that, that urging by the Holy Spirit to live in a way that is holy will transform you from the very depths of your heart to the highways of your mind. And he'll give you the ability to live in harmony, to be sympathetic, to love as brothers, to be compassionate and humble, to do good, regardless of circumstances or situations. Whether you've heard the message of Jesus Christ for the first time today or the 150th time, truly will you commit to letting Jesus be the Lord of your heart? Is your heart primed for offense or defense? Defense is not the same as defensive. Being prepared with a defense of your hope is just being prepared to share. Friends, how's the walk? How is your walk with our Holy Lord? And here's the truth that will be evident in how you treat other people. If you're suffering this morning, I would just beg you to let the Holy Spirit give you comfort. Let the church, let the body of believers come alongside you and give you practical relief and comfort. Recognize suffering for what it is and keep doing good. We have a closing song today and we're gonna spread this out just a little bit and we're gonna sing two verses and then we're gonna take time to pray. The altars, of course, are open. If you need support from the spiritual house today, if you need someone to pray with you, pull them up here with you or go sit with them. But don't go through our suffering alone. It's a reality of life. Don't go through your walk of holiness alone. We're called to be a spiritual house that supports one another. Let's sing these two verses and we'll take time to pray together this morning. But don't miss the opportunity to consider the condition of your heart.